Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Jason Sklar. Thanks for coming to this demo session. Um, just a couple of leading questions, then I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, first is, how many of you do user research as a job? And you can broadly define user research. Okay, so most of you. And do games user research as a job currently? Okay, okay, so a couple of you who are not yet, but probably possibly aspiring to get into the games user research career. Um, so that's how many of you are looking to break in? The two, three, awesome. Um, can people just, through a show of hands, I'll ask for two categories. Categorize your primary motivation to work in games user research. Either be it primarily, I want to make better games, or primarily, I have an academic and other research interests. So I want to just make better games, hands up. And academic research primarily. Awesome, really cool mix. Um, and as an aside, like, there's the strategic tactical kind of thing, like the, you know, the, the story of the, like, hey, there's all these babies floating down the river, I'm going to pull them out one by one, versus, like, I'm going to stop the person from throwing the baby in. And so a lot of the academic <laughs> research that's really coming to the field is, like, at a strategic level addressing user research and the stuff that practitioners, like myself, can really take advantage of and do better research and make games better. Um, so the purpose of my demo and what I think we can learn maybe in 30 minutes, and I don't, I'm probably not any more expert at usability per se than a lot of you in this room, so I certainly don't like take that as an expert. I'm going to show you kind of one aspect in, in how I do some of this. Um, but basically my talk is about how do we make, how do we work with teams, development teams, to make games more approachable, engaging, and fun. Um, and it's really focused on the team interaction and how do we get the most um, to our team. And um, if you don't get enough on the usability from here, Brock will be talking most, like a lot more about user research methods over there. There's a lot of papers about it. There's college courses on it. Like there's a lot of great resources. But mostly it's just practice and experience, right? Getting better at it, having feedback, um, in doing the actual one-on-one. -on -one. And I focus on the one-on-one -on -one usability because that's mostly what I've been doing. Um, but there are other tools of the trade and, and they're certainly useful. Um, and when appropriate, I use those as well. <clears throat> and so really I'm going to focus on the just before the actual user session and then the just after the user session ends. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on here. So if you wanted to do more than like what happens during that entire time, now I'll close my eyes and look back and you can <laughs> disappear to the other room. Um, as I said, there's lots more methods than just one-on-one -on -one usability testing. Um, and this is a great place to learn about them if you don't already know. Um, there are lots of great ways to do usability. I have an approach that I like, that I find effective, that I also tailor to specific situations and environments. But my way is not the only way. You should definitely explore other ones. Um, and hopefully through some of the interactive exercises, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of those. Um, and basically, I'm going to show you a little bit about my process and not only how I do it, but usually I will, a lot of my work nowadays is working with development teams who either wouldn't do it because they haven't thought to do it or they don't think they have the resources to do it or who are trying to do user research on their own. But it's, it's both the fox guard guarding the hen house problem, um, you know, doing research on your own games, not being maybe as objective as you can. And also, just, to, just honest, they don't know how to do the best kind of objective research and find the best findings. And so I help them improve. I also help them not only find the better findings, but work with their implementers and designers to help them come up with better solutions. Because um, I've got a kind of deep background in that. First thing, don't get intimidated by this. You just saw a lab tour of one of the most amazing uh, <laughs> setups that they have, possibly anywhere. I mean, the Microsoft, the Microsoft Research Center is bigger and grander and more expensive and fancier, but this is pretty darn fancy. Um, you can do usability anywhere. I've had clients where I've just had to like take a service closet and like we just put the skateboard and the camera and you know we just do it sort of just like that. It's it's the, the it's just like the lab coat. The lab coat doesn't make the scientists right. The room doesn't necessarily make the, the research valid or not valid. It's your approach and how you work with the team um, and deliver them the results that they need. The most important factors I find, if I'm speaking too quickly, if someone just put up their hand, I can slow down. Also, feel free to interject. I've got some interactive exercises that we're just about to start, so we can talk a bit more informally or casually at that point as well. Um, so to me, the most important factors of the lab setup are that the person can play naturalistically, depending on the kind of game that they're experiencing. So I've worked on games where you've been on a peripheral. I've worked on games where you're controlling a robot through your phone. Work worked on games where you're sitting on your couch playing a console or in a chair playing on your PC. You just need to make sure that they can play it as they would play it on their own. Um, you need to be able to observe in a way that lets you run effective sessions without biasing or introducing as little bias as possible. Um, and you need to be able to manage the development team who will either be on site, which is the way I like to do it, or you need to, if, if they're not on site, you don't have to worry as much about that. But you do need to worry about how I'm going to communicate data to them away from here, especially if they want to watch the findings live or, or see video of it. <clears throat> so the first exercise, because a lot of you are already practicing user research, 
we've already seen this kind of living room sort of setup. What other kinds of setups are people familiar with or do people like to use with their kinds of research in terms of just the physical arrangement um, of the cameras and the equipment? Who wants to chime in? I've, I've used uh, two laptops uh, sitting side by side. Um, well, actually, one my laptop's just for note taking, and then the one on one person's using a laptop that would project on a big screen, so I don't have to loom over their their shoulder, and then they use the laptop, and then I can observe on the screen. Mm -hmm. I set up I use for mobile usability, which is mostly what I do. I'm sitting beside the person, and I have a camera on a tripod type thing that's, that's shooting that, and then the, so I'm taking notes here. And I don't me on mobile phone, whatever. Even though I've got a uh, laptop right here, which is taking. The video from the phone and and then getting so I can stream it to the clients to see. I, I still like to just look. Yeah. And I take notes on a laptop while it's happening in the moment, which is a little hair raising, but it <laughs> seems like a good idea. Yeah. Any other? Old days arcade games or had Atari with one way glass, arcade yeah. machines in the room. Yeah. And the team behind me. Yeah, yeah, team behind the last two talking. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Um, so, um, and there's also, there's different researcher preferences. So we've heard a couple of people who are sitting side by side or in the same room with them. There's also the voice of God where I'll just sit out in the other room, I'll introduce the person to the room and all they hear is the voice back and forth. And some people are super opposed to that. I find it can be very effective, especially if you have the teammates back there and you can talk candidly about what you're seeing and that's about managing the team. Um, but obviously, and, and the way they do it at Sony actually is they have someone in the room to be the personal person who's actually sort of um, building a trust relationship and moderating, but they also have another researcher who's sitting with the team and talking to the team about what they're seeing, seeing too. Uh, and then they can triangulate at the end or biangulate. I mean, the two of them can get together at the end and, and, and talk about what they see because sometimes uh, there might be some interesting differences in what they noted. I'll just say, if you're in the room yourself, just do it that way. You can, of course, chat to the team. And I found some teams don't even want to bother. Or, yeah. you know, but they really chat back and forth. It's probably not as good as what you're talking about if it works pretty well. Yeah, and, and for me, I like the team to observe in real time, and I like to chat with them in real time because I like to make sure that we're all on board and seeing. There's, there's two things. One is like making sure the shared reality is, is the reality that I want them to see or that you know we should come together to see. Um, and the other is, is that a lot of people, especially newer teams, they get super jazzed about seeing all this, and then they start like, oh my god, we gotta fix this, we gotta fix that, we gotta change this, we gotta change that, and whoa, 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 like I, I actually do like rapid iteration, but we, we've gotta be strategic about it, right? We can't just have everyone go off on it. You can actually make things much, much worse. And some of their solutions that they'll think of to the problems are actually probably potentially worse than what the current implementation is. So you need to be able to sort of monitor that kind of activity in the, in the lab, and that's how I, I tend to do things, I tend to not not be in the room, I tend to be observing, and I'll do it either um, by setting something up on site, or I'll, um, I'll have them do the study with a moderator in the room with the person, and then I'll be viewing it remotely over the internet, um, and in it, but in a chat room with the other developers who are sitting watching um, either through the internet or in another room. Um, and that's, we can have great conversations, and, I'll, and I can also get the moderator's feedback on their techniques, what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. I can suggest different tasks to try out and things like that. So focusing on the pre-study now, um, preparation. So preparing, preparing the team. Um, the first time you work with a team is different than like if you've already got an established relationship with the team. We all should know that. Um, and the first time with the team, I normally go about it, I, I talk with them, I've already reviewed the game ideally. I talk with them about things that I expect to see um, when the sessions start and things that we should pay attention to. Um, and I make sure that our goals are aligned in terms of what we're hoping to get out of it. Is this gonna be like, are we just curious to know who can succeed after you know the first few minutes or who throws down the, the controller and discuss? Um, or are there certain facets of the game that are really important to them that I need to make sure we get coverage on um, and, and figure out naturalistic, ideally naturalistic ways to get them into that aspect of the gameplay so that we can, we can observe them doing it. Um, I also try to set expectations. A, a lot of you who've done user research, you know what it's like. You recruit seven subjects. Five of them are perfectly on profile and awesome, and two of them are how the heck did they get in here? <laughs> um, and so setting expectations for your, especially if you're working with a team for the first time and they're already maybe a little skeptical about this and they maybe have preconceptions about who gamers are and things like that, it's good to work with them to uh, make them understand that Yes, we will get some out of profile people, and yes, we will caveat some of their results, especially if we're doing attitudinal data or anything like that. But as it turns out, like a lot of people play a lot of games, and so there, there aren't pure profiles necessarily,
But also, like a lot of games, is um, about popularity, word of mouth, and, and approachability for anyone is actually pretty important. Now, do you want a person who's never played a first-person shooter game to be your core usability person? If I have five of them in a row in my shooter game, yeah, that's probably a waste of study. But having one or two of them, actually, you can really learn some interesting things. And just like the field of accessibility, like trying to make things accessible for people with um, cognitive, visual, and other kinds of impairments, makes games often, or makes software often, better use for other folks. Accommodating for different play styles or different folks with different experiences can also really improve the game UX overall. If you're not careful, it can destroy the UX for the core players, and you've got to obviously yeah. not do that. Yeah. Do, you, um, do you have a quick question? Yeah, yeah. Um, when you're recruiting for these users, uh, do you try and fit the demographic for what the market is trying to do or what the market currently is? For an example, like first person shooter, maybe it's like 10% of women play first person shooter. Will you try and recruit that same? kind of statistical range? We do behavioral based, I usually do behavioral based, um, so what do you buy and play? Do you buy and play games like the game we're trying to ship? You're part of our market. If we want to be sure that we're, we, we can overrepresent represent certain demographics if we're unsure if there's going to be age differences or things like that, but we, I, it tends, the, the profile screening that most of these companies use and that I certainly use are what games are you, being, are you, are you playing and buying? And if you're playing and buying the kind of games that we're trying to make, you're, we're trying to make that's who we want. You, especially when you're running usability studies, you don't want to get them all exactly to be equal in, in terms of their depth. So you'd like to work with your recruiters to make sure you have a nice mix of folks within that behavioral gaming de demographic. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we don't focus on, I don't, and I tend to try to work again, I don't, I'm one of those people who's like, gender issues in gaming in terms of how people play are interested in terms of gender studies, but like, games should be enjoyable by all, and there's no like, females play this way or males play that way. Like, you can certainly generalize and base it on anecdotes, but actually, as it turns out, like gamers who play certain types of games like playing those games and buy those games, and so we should be making it for, you know. And if, if it's a more casual genre where we're expecting a more 50-50 split, then I'll definitely make sure that the sample is a 50-50 split. If it's a hardcore, crun you know, like crunchy RPG that tends to be overrepresented with the males, then I'll tend to overrepresent with the males. That just the market forces sort of dictate that. But you're missing out on this great opportunity to potentially make the game more approachable to a wider audience, mm -hmm. as opposed to shrinking your audience over here. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback to that question. Not necessarily the gender discrepancies, although they kind of play in that direction, yeah. but it's not what games do you play? Um, maybe games, let's say if you're looking for a first-person shooter game, like what games do you not play, and you want them to play first-person shooter, um, how then do you convert them? Or how do you see how they interact with the game, and what would bring them on? So do you try to target the market that you don't already have? If, if the team, so I worked on like a couple games like that. One is like I worked on a flight combat game that wanted to appeal to action adventure gamers. So flight combat tended to have like more advanced features and you control all the ailerons and everything. I'm getting the terminology wrong, I'm sure, but like it's all like simulation-y and all that sort of stuff, but they really wanted to be uh, Indiana Jones in the sky. And so I said to them, you know, you can, you can recruit a bunch of people who play flight, you know, flight games and combat flight games, but if you're really going to be hardcore about, like, we don't have to be accessible to any action adventure gamer, then we need to recruit people who are action adventure gamers who do not play flight simulation games. So you're, you're exactly right. You definitely want to do that sort of stuff sometimes. Um, and I worked on other games where, yeah, RPGs that had fight combat, we wanted to get fight people in who didn't mess with the RPGs to see if they enjoyed the fight. So it really just depends on your research question. And it's, you've got to be up front with the team and you're kind of stacking the deck against yourself by adding these other profiles and making sure you succeed with those profiles too. But it's, if, you're, if, if your stated business goal is we want to be bringing fight games to RPG players, then you need to test with those folks too. So maybe it depends on how much time you have and what your budget is, right? Yeah. Absolutely, because these things, as it turns out, like generally, I mean, I don't know how many of you do usabilities with clients or, or with your, for your company, but in general, if you do like a four or five person or six person usability study, you can give the dev team more work than they can possibly do for the next month or what have you. Like that's a sort of standard anecdotal story in, in the industry. And so you've got to be really careful about um, where do I want my coverage and where do I want to focus? Because we can give you all sorts of feedback, but you might not be able to, to um, act on it. Or you can, if you have the luxury, you can get all this feedback and then at that point start to prioritize. Okay, well, we've got all this feedback pointing us all these different directions. Really our strategic priority is here, so we're going to focus on that. Uh, and it's just good to know all that data anyhow. Um, let's see, I talked about streaming. Um, 
the other aspect of, yeah, we talked about profile, so I, screening. So for me, one of the most important things that I think I do at the beginning of a session um, is that I, I actually try personally to go and greet the person, or I train the moderator who's doing it to grow and, and have a conversation with that person about how many focus groups have they done recently, um, what kinds of games are they playing, uh, what are they playing recently, what have they spent money on or bought. And I try to do it in a very casual conversational, because the problem isn't necessarily that your screeners are doing a bad job. It's, it's really hard to self-report on some of these things. People are playing tons of things. I played the latest Batman game. Well, guess what? Batman had an RTS, an RPG, like a mobile free-to-play game. And this, so they, they might say they played the game that was in profile, but they might have actually been playing other games. And so when I, when I know that, then I, and then I can judge myself, well, from the developer perspective, is this person on profile or off profile? I can set expectations for the developer and say, hey, this person plays a bunch of games similar to, but not exactly in our target, so you know we have to watch this one with a grain of salt. Um, or, oh my goodness, this guy play, This guy is your target user. He plays 100 hours of this game that is a, your direct competitor, so like, really pay attention here, right? So it, it's, I find it, and then for the, for the like, pro tester, in terms of people who participate in a lot of focus groups, like they're just, depending on what market you're in, you might just find like you're getting people who've been in, their, their job is to go and participate in focus studies, right? And they're fine, generally, as participants, but you don't want to have a session, at least in my mind, um, a session where you only have pro testers, because they are kind of different. When you have that fresh person who's all starry-eyed and walks in, it's like, I'm going to test a game. Like, it's, it's just it's nice to have a mix of people who are not quite as um, institutionalized, I guess, into the system. Um, for me, a warm-up task is really important um, for the reason that I'll get into in just a moment. Um, let's see, we have till 2.15, so we're too good on time. Um, the world task is super important to me because I like to do the think aloud protocol, which is try to have them talk as they play. Obviously, if they don't talk, then you know you can try prompting them and such. But for me, the first five minutes of gameplay, I don't like. I don't want to say a single word. I feel that, especially when I'm working in mobile games, like for if I'm working on console or PC games, maybe I'll I'll even take a longer time where I won't say a word. I mean, I won't say a word. They could have closed the application by mistake. They could have. Don't say a word, find out what they do, because oftentimes you can actually find really interesting things. And your potential to blow the entire session by intervening during those first few minutes is huge, right? You can just totally um, teach them something that will totally spoil the rest of the results because you can't trust any of them in terms of discoverability, like when they've discovered it on their own or figured it out on their own. So I really, really am just like, so I do a warm-up task to get them into the groove of playing um, and uh, talking aloud while they while they play. So if it's like when I worked on Facebook games, I would do, hey, walk me through what you do when you log into Facebook at first and make sure you're talking aloud, play one of your favorite games for a couple of minutes. Okay, now I'm going to switch you over to the game. Remember, I've told you to talk aloud. Once then, and then at that point, I can remind them a few times. Oh, can you just talk a little louder? Can you talk towards the mic? Can you say a few more words while you're playing? Obviously, when games get super intense, like I work on combat games and stuff like that, people can't talk while they're playing. And so that it's understood that that happens. But the more that we can at least preload the importance of them talking and not interrupt their session by doing those kinds of prompts, especially early on. So they can be super distracting. You can just totally sidetrack someone and they'll focus on an aspect of the UI that's totally different than what they're originally trying to do and you've told it, you've just blown it. Um, the pilot. First session for me is always a pilot and I always market it that way to my team. Anything can go wrong. With, I mean, if you have the routine down and you've done the test several times this, the, and the setup is the same and all that sort of stuff, generally speaking, you'll be okay in the first session and you can, everything will run smoothly, the person will show up, the build will be working, the task list that you made will be just perfect and keep them on track. Um, but as we, I hear the chuckles, yes, like yeah. once the, the actual like combat starts, like all the rules change. So, um, so you need to not only market it as such, but also give yourself appropriate gap in between the first session and a later session so that you can react, talk with the team, figure out what you want to do um, to accommodate for it. Um, as well, you might, you, you just, because these things don't, because these things can be super eye-opening, like, as user experience professionals, you've already been giving the team feedback or they've already seen usability results. And so you set expectations and there's lots of things that you already expect to see. But the awesome thing about user testing is that sometimes, and sometimes frequently, you see things that you never would have guessed, but that totally makes sense to me. It's not just a fluke thing you're seeing, but like, oh my goodness, I never would have predicted it, but it totally makes sense that they did that. And so you need to be able to, to react to that and then potentially scale or change the direction of the test to reflect that reality. You tend to put the uh, uh, subjects in any certain order. Like, like, like if, <clears throat> if you had seven 
and you know you have that pilot what you call the pilot mm -hmm. and you kind of want to work out some bugs in that do you use maybe one of those two that are kind of the wild cards you know that oh you, interesting. You, you, like you don't know why how, how they even got in the group right yeah uh, usually the scheduling logistics the way they work out because you're doing them one after another during the period of a day or whatever at least on the one-on-one -on -one, yeah, is that you kind of have the person who's there at 7 a.m and so if it's your perfect subject and you blow it but that there's another the other point that I'm going to make later is that actually letting people go off the rails after they've blown it, you can actually learn a heck of a lot by through just watching the degenerate play that they're going through. What are they trying to achieve on their own, even though they're totally confused and lost? Because it can both be a vector for creativity, like oh, there's all sorts of ways to play this game that we never thought of, but it also can be like you know what, our board does make it look like you're a medieval hero with a sword. In that's not a crossbow. Like we need it's not a UI thing. It's a like. We need, like, our game just really teaches you the wrong thing just by looking at it, and we need to fix that. Um, and that's, a, like, a deeper deeper problem to solve. Um, so we've, we've got till 2.15. I was going to demo my intake procedure for a minute or so, but I think I've talked through it. Um, I'm, but I'm happy to do that. Just, like, give you my, like, hey, I, someone could be my participant, and I can just walk you through. Do people think that would be useful, or do you think they'd like me to get towards the, um, the let's see, um, the when so I, so I've got I can do the quick demo of like it takes a couple minutes of just how I introduce a person to the lab. I can talk about when do you test a game, which is often a question of interest, like when in the life cycle do you test a game and how do you work with teams on that. I can talk about um, after the lab, lab study is over, the last participant is run. How do you um, debrief with the team and make sure the results are done? I have a feeling those two things are probably more interesting than the standard like intro. I think so. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Let me cover those things, and I apologize for having more content than I, um, than I have time to cover, but I'm happy to chat with folks after, or I don't know if people are going to be around for the next session, but, you know, after, the, after both the sessions. So when do you test the game? Um, and this isn't a rhetorical question. When do you test the game? As soon as possible. As soon as possible. <laughs> well, are we testing for fun or usability here? Uh, good question. Concept stage. Yeah, if it's fun, I'd say early... Minimum viable product at stage. Uh, you change your expectation about the test as the production ramp up, so it starts like one on one feasibility test and you ramp up to larger uh, fun tests, for example. Mm -hmm. My basic rule is ideally when you can still have meaningful impact before development halts, right? So you're all right, and, and as early as possible, you yes, right? The but, yeah, but it's for me, so there are philosophical differences in, like for me, I only like to test playable stuff. I'm happy to iterate with folks, and if we want to put interactive wireframes together to test UI flows, I'm happy to, to do some of that stuff. But the actual game, I want to have an actual prototype that has, it's, it's, it, it has reasonable amounts of feedback in the game, the controls are kind of like what they want them to be, um, and uh, the board set up and everything is, is kind of in a very playable state. So some very representative. It doesn't have to be visually representative, although what you'll find is, is that you're actually going to learn a whole bunch of new different things at that point. So you can do a lot of testing beforehand, but the game changes once you start to get into the final visual state, um, like the vertical slice that you normally think about. Um, but the key is, is that like when you have a chance to do meaningful work and drive the results into the game before development halts, right? It's not very useful to do user research when they're not going to make any fixes based on your findings. Except for, I'll, I'll get to your question in just a second as you have your hand up. Except for sometimes you need to do it for buy-in purposes, right? You need to show them, rub their noses in it a little bit, but in a very polite and understanding way because you're going to have a long-term relationship with these folks, ideally, and they're going to have a next game. Yeah. Um, and so, the, and they'll be, 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 oftentimes team, like the best teams to work with, all, the great teams, they'll feel the pain and they'll understand it and they'll be sad that they can't change it and they'll know next time I'm going to do this earlier, right? So sometimes you have to spend those bullets in test games that you won't actually be able to, to impact, but... Um, but that's that's the way it is. Do you do much concept testing at the very early stages? I don't. I'm a big believer in that. I was at Sega, and we I think it works better when you're at a big place where there's a lot of games and a lot of ideas, and you crank through, like you present 20 things, and you come up with the five you're going to make. I find it to be very, very effective. Development people often kind of hate it. They feel like, you know, you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, my game didn't get a chance to come to life. Mm -hmm. But in my experience, if, if 
I mean, if you're running a big company, I mean, that's, that's how I would do it. I just think you, yeah. you tend to get the things that, things that are really great do tend to come to the top. I don't know what the hindsight like or counterfactual to that would be. Like I don't know how you'd prove that one way or the other. Right. And it's all about execution in a lot of ways and timing. So I, I don't mean to be difficult. Like I actually think like a lot of people I know and who do research and who I respect very much do concept testing and, and some companies get a lot of value out of it. That's just not what I would like as a career, that's not what I I want to do. And I I don't mean to even judge that in any way, it's just like there's probably room for it, but that's not what I'm that that I couldn't get up in the morning and do and do that kind of stuff because I really like to work with teams who are developing the stuff already. And but I realize you could be saving the company millions of dollars by like eliminating yeah. things that will never ever. <laughs> um, and the other question I wanted to get to is, do you need to have a tutorial first before you do your first usability? I'm seeing some nods. Yes, it's a trick question. I'm seeing some nods. Zero. It depends what you call a tutorial. Uh, onboarding. Uh, so as you would ship the game, the first user experience, um, stru you know, structured in however way that you expect it to, to 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 launch. You can have something that will look like the final tutorial like on, on paper if it's not in the game or something like that. I mean, in game. I mean, do you need to have like some sort of onboarding there where it's like. You're expecting to teach the player how to play the game through ideas. Depends on the game. No, I don't Depends. Think so. I mean, I make games for four-year-olds, so right. yeah. So I would argue, no. Yeah, uh, do also, that. QRC, and let me. I'll give you my reasons of why I'm being <laughs> facetious. Obviously, um, what about a QRC, a quick reference card like this? What are the basic controls? How do you move around and stuff like that? Obviously, a good game should help you be able to play without that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, and actually, I'm not even going to go there because I think you're right. Um, but actually, what I think is most interesting is to have people put their hands on the thing when all they have is board pieces, controls that they have to figure out themselves, and feedback that the game's providing them. Um, I really, it, it can be painful as hell to watch that, right? And as it turns out, your job is going to be very different in those circumstances. It's going to be, you're now going to start off with a very, you're going to let them struggle for five minutes and it's going to be painful, and then you're going to have a task list, you're going to um, slowly figure out as naturalistically as possible, how do I guide these people through the different gameplay systems by giving them typical goals that they might have as a player and seeing how they achieve them. What you can do, I'm gonna to get to your question in just one second. What you can do at that point is that you learn how people expect to play the game given that setup, given those controls, given that feedback. And by focusing on the core loop, the core feedback, the core mechanics, um, and fixing those early on, that means that your onboarding later on can be a lot lighter weight and you don't need to focus so much on like the kludgy tutorials that we often see where it's, here's a billboard of text, um, go to it. And you can do the bare minimum needed to get people onboarded through gameplay. Um, so this is the thing, this is kind of how I built my career is working on folks with that, convincing them not to use, not to use tutorials and not to do, now, do you need to use usability testing on the tutorials and ideally on the control sheets and all that sort of stuff. Absolutely, you have to do that sort of stuff. And play, extended play testing and make sure people can press it. You absolutely need to do it. Too many teams I've seen um, flail around on the onboarding. If you do the onboarding too early, you spend so much time trying to fix the onboarding that you never get a chance to address the core issues in the gameplay itself. And it's amazing what people can actually learn by playing the game if you actually make the game itself more usable. Obviously, there's going to be exceptions. Obviously, there's going to be certain genres of games or certain types of audiences where you need more intervention at the beginning. But I really think it's important to have people play the game with no guidance whatsoever. Um, except for the, when you intervene as the experimenter with some interesting goals that, they, that the designers themselves expect them to have internally and then how do they achieve those goals and observe them. Because they can teach you a lot about how you should design the game as well and the feedback systems and how to improve them. Um, I would never have thought of that except what you're making me think is that uh, if they're just struggling and flailing all around. What you realize is you realize the places where people get confused the most. And that might inform, okay, these are the 10 things that I really got to cover in the tutorial instead of, the, like you said, the 29 yes. things with all this mounts of text, which makes some of that yes. stupid and wasted. I, people hate tutorials. And when, so. I, when I was working on Rise of Nations back then, I sort of, we, we, we didn't do any tutorials because basically all their tutorials were linear and really crappy and all the experienced players would break them. Not through any fault of their own, but this is how people designed tutorials back then. And what we were able to do is we were able to come up with what are the seven things in the first hour of play that people stumble on. Okay, let's find a way to bridge address those things. That. Not yeah. addressing the hundred other things that maybe they would have a problem with. Um, and I think we're over time. <laughs> but people seem to still be going. So if you don't mind me keeping for a couple more minutes, I can talk about the final thing, which is after the final participant is run. Mm -hmm. 
you had a, it's your a hand up, though. Yeah, this is more interesting. Okay. <laughs> um, so, how do we communicate our findings with, uh, with the team, and what should our goal be in the communication process? So, we, the last participant is finished on a three-day study. Um, what happens now in terms of communicating with the team? Like coding all the qualitative. Okay, so coding some of the data, maybe writing a report. A set timeline for the deliverable. Yeah. Um, a, set, a set timeline. For our deliverable to the team? Yeah. Okay, you're all wrong. Um, <laughs> the debrief with the team should occur as you go. Okay, every participant that you run is a time for you to interact with the team afterwards. It shouldn't be, oh my god, here's all the problems, oh my god, we need to fix everyone, oh my god, here are 13 <laughs> solutions, I'm so smart, aren't I? No, it should be, hey, here's some, here are a few things that we've identified that are problems. Let's, let's try to fix them now so that for day two, maybe, yeah. we can have a fixed build, right, and we don't have to see these things again. Or, these are a little trickier, thornier. Um, let's, let's think about them for a few days and see how they emerge and over time and think about solutions more, like, it, it's going to take more time to come up with the elegant solution for this. Or we don't even really fully understand the problem right now. Those things could happen. Oh, can I lock us in? Ah! <laughs> Hi. Can I have like another minute? No, you're good to just keep going, but at any point if you want to rotate out, that's fine. Okay. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish because you might want to see what Brock has to do as well. He's, he's going to talk about some other stuff. Um, so, should occur as you go. Um, I do, I like to do in between sessions. I like to do a daily recap, right? Let's just talk about what we saw today. Um, a quick follow up, and then after you run the study, right? We should talk about like, it's easy to say that. You can do this because if you're going to be sloppy about your research, if you're going to um, just see only what you want to see, like the, you've got to be careful about the rigor and the coding that has to occur and all the stuff that has to, that really complements the research and makes the research solid and great. But there's a lot of stuff, especially as you become more experienced, work on more and more games, that you really can, sitting there with the developers, figure out right away and fix. And there are deeper problems where it's like, at the end of the, at the, end of the sessions, it's not necessarily like... Did, you know, what was our failure rate there? What, what, you know, how many times did they say something as opposed to what we wanted them to say or do something? We, we don't know. We were, we've been in this lab for three days staring at screens and yelling at each other. We need some sort of, like, actual refereed set of data that we can agree on and, and be sure. And so there's definitely time for that. There's definitely need for that as well. Um, how do you communicate your, your, what's going on to your other teams and market yourself as an organization to other teams, like giving the amazing presentations that we've seen today, right? If you didn't collect the data, analyze the data, and do a lot of stuff, building yourself as an org would be harder, right? You need to have these reports and stuff. But generally speaking, development teams are working so fast in the game industry, especially the mobile industry, that like if you take the time to code everything and then write the report and then talk about it, people have forgotten about it, the game's already changed. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to keep the conversation going all throughout, at least in my life. Um, and so you're not wrong, because that's, it's great to debrief with them a couple days later and do all the coding and all that sort of stuff. It's absolutely great and important to do that sort of stuff. But really, from my perspective, it's great to do it. Yeah, I like, I mean, and I'm not always testing games. I'm sometimes testing, like, parents interacting with stuff um, related to our games. But I like to kind of, I'm moderating usually. Mm -hmm. I like to go back to the people observing in between each one and just kind of align on, like, okay, here's what I think the three or four things are that I saw in that. Yep. Because, I'm, yeah, I'm taking notes, but I'm also trying to moderate. So it's nice to have that kind of, like, okay, do we see eye to eye and, like, what the four things were that went wrong there? And yep. then again, if you can iterate for the next day, it's yep. great. But at least you then, at least you're having the conversation about the same thing. And at that point, you know what are the things we've already got consensus on, right. and what are the two other things that I need to convince them on, yeah. or I need to be convinced that maybe it's not a problem. And right, we'll or in just... the next session, I need to really probe more on this. Exactly. That's what, that's, sorry, that, yeah. you're exactly right. That's, exa that's what I was trying to say, but you said it much better. Yeah. Yeah, and kind of rethinking uh, the way we worked years ago. So <clears throat> we would do all the focus groups in one day, four to six. Yeah. Six to eight, eight through ten, three groups, right? And then after each group, we would kind of, kind of, real quickly, yes. what, are the, what are our takeaways, you know, and see if there's any patterns. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all I have here is like a couple of summary notes, so I'll just state them quickly and then we can have some questions and answers um, or, and talk about other issues that I didn't get to cover that people thought they'd like to cover. Um, so, like, just to summarize, um, I focus less on how you actually conduct the study here, obviously, uh, more on setting expectations with the team beforehand, um, and how you, how I interact with them during the study that's going on. Um, uh, and I want to remind folks that, like, a great making a great game or software or any kind of product takes an effective collaboration of experts 
some of whom are experts in other things than you, and you're expert in things that they're not. Um, a good user researcher identifies and prioritizes UX issues and writes a report. A good but ineffective researcher focuses too much as on, on solutions and recommendations instead of ensuring the team understands and agrees with the UX issues and the prioritization of those. Especially in games. We're all passionate about games. We've yeah. played lots of games. We have lots of game ide design ideas that we want to implement. One of the things you can do to shoot yourself in the foot with a new developer that doesn't, you're not familiar with it is come up with a bunch of really bad recommendations, and we all do it. Yeah. We get better at it. Um, but a great user researcher works closely with the development team to understand the issues deeply, come up with solutions that they can, together that can make the game better. And so that's my collaborative approach to UX. And if they're kicking us out, well, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry I didn't leave time for questions. But I'll be around after the session. Okay, so I've got, uh,